there and um, thank you for your time and consideration today. And uh, also uh, thanks to all the organizers and supporters of today's event. Um, I'll give um, about a 10 to 15 minute presentation on the kind of push and pull factors of the distribution of kind of Chinese surveillance technologies. Um, and then I will kind of open it up uh, to some, some of your questions and concerns. Uh, I partly am you know, aiming to kind of give room to your questions as a way to somewhat guide the discussion today. Um, and again, uh, my name is uh, Bulalani Jili and I'm a PhD candidate here at Harvard uh, as a Meta Research Fellow. I'm also um, a visiting fellow at uh, Yale Law School and a Cybersecurity Fellow at HKS and a fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, I will kind of frame my presentation around uh, three points about the distribution of Chinese surveillance technologies in the global south, uh, with a special attention to Kenya as a kind of a grounding case um, for some of the points that will be made. Firstly, uh, my presentation aims to offer insight into how China's domestic environment helps the promotion of the exportation of surveillance products into the global south and um, across the global north also, but with a particular emphasis on um, the global south, with Africa and South America being kind of key sites of the distribution of these technologies. Secondly, I point out how uh, domestic environments in Africa motivate the procurement of these kind of uh, digital surveillance technologies. And then finally, I kind of argue that the adoption of new technologies in countries like Kenya and really across the global south um, is really accompanied by implementation of kind of robust regulatory frameworks. And it is kind of this gap between these uh, novel technological employments and regulatory framework adoption that permits the kind of undermining of civil liberties uh, across the globe. And so in regards to Chinese domestic factors and environment, the Chinese state innovation policy and state procurement are the kind of driving factors for the growth of the domestic surveillance market. From the vantage point of the Chinese state, um, R&D investment in digital surveillance technologies is necessary uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, the state's ambition to be a global uh, technology leader. In 2017, uh, the Chinese State Council published a plan aiming to become the world leader in AI and surveillance technologies by 2030. And in 2018, um, China's investments in AI already became uh, about half of the world's total investments within that space. Uh, secondly, um, AI surveillance products offer Beijing an enhanced means for domestic social control. Um, this move to advance social control is marked by an ambition to, con to control online activity and debate, target ethnic minorities like Uyghurs, and then increase um, public surveillance practices. And so for instance, the Sharp Eyes program, which is a digital video surveillance initiative, offers the state the means to conduct surveillance of public squares and transportation hubs across China's major cities. Uh, and this will include places like uh, Shanghai and Beijing and so forth. And importantly, um, these surveillance aims are made possible and procured through with the support of Chinese uh, large tech firms uh, that develop and provide the services that utilize the means of um, identification and the mitigation of online speech. Uh, and so this includes companies like Hackvision, McV, Roteg, Goldweb, and so forth. And so in a way, um, it is the kind of public-private collaboration and partnership that have uh, fueled the rise of uh, Chinese surveillance products. Um, and uh, have enabled um, an environment that then supports the exportation of uh, these products abroad. And so the Chinese government um, promotes uh, surveillance technology and practices abroad through, infra through infrastructure investments, um, diplomatic exchange, law enforcement cooperation, and training programs um, across um, the Global South. Uh, and this is uh, best represented by the kind of China-Africa Operation Beijing Action Plan, uh, which aims 
to support and offer a space uh, for China to further promote um, African smart cities uh, with the focus on promoting uh, public safety and countering uh, crime and terrorism within those regions. Um, and so these initiatives are also grounded um, by older and more comprehensive policy objectives that are marked by kind of two early foreign uh, aid white papers published in 2011 and 2014, which underscored um, that China's approach to kind of foreign policy by explaining how trade and industrial aid can support its kind of diplomatic ambitions in the global south um, with, an, with an attention to Africa in particular. And so as a result, you kind of see an expansion of overseas digital infrastructure investments uh, that are both vertically integrate Chinese firms into foreign consumer markets, but also help secure access to markets that have great demand for digital infrastructure and surveillance. And so from the perspective of kind of African state actors, the kind of procurement of these uh, digital infrastructure and surveillance uh, tools can then be justified by, uh, by means of delivering uh, development, uh, but also establishing further security. And so typically um, uh, digital surveillance products come as a part of an assemblage of kind of ICT products, which then include digital cameras, data centers, and other advanced kind of uh, biometrical devices that then are integrated and utilized to support security and uh, supposedly developmental um, ambitions within those given countries. And so for instance, in Kenya, uh, the first uh, Chinese um, African safe city project uh, was able to connect about uh, 1,800 high definition cameras and 200 high definition traffic surveillance infrastructure across Nairobi. And furthermore, um, a national police command center was established to support over about 9,000 police officers and 195 police stations. Um, this was all made uh, possible uh, uh, via Huawei's kind of technical support, but also financing coming from the Axiom Bank. Uh, and so the employment of these technologies uh, supposedly uh, supports crime prevention and accelerated response and recovery. And yet, you know, uh, what is clear is that the benefits of kind of Huawei safe city projects are hard to verify and appear exaggerated in some instances. Uh, and so according to Huawei, um, you know, uh, crime rates um, from 2014 to 2015 uh, decreased by, you know, an absurd number, like 46% in areas supported by their technologies. Uh, but when you kind of look into Kenya's National Police Service reports, um, they indicate significantly uh, smaller reductions in crime uh, during uh, those years in those areas supported uh, by these new technologies. And so this circumstance um, in some uh, way then thrusts um, Kenya and other kind of uh, countries across the global south into a kind of a critical inflection point um, split between the means to kind of further surveil their citizens and interest in somewhat promoting um, the civil liberties uh, tradition. And, um, and more importantly, um, we also then see um, no strong correlation uh, between uh, the procurement of uh, Chinese surveillance technologies with the reduction of crime, but we do see um, increased instances of um, jailing of journalists um, across um, East Africa. Um, and so, you know, um, what I try and really establish in some of my work is that it's this kind of the gap between these kind of novel uh, technological employments and regulatory environments uh, that are then permitting um, an increase um, in human rights violations. And so when you look in, into Africa more specifically, about half of the countries uh, don't have any data protection laws in their books. And if they do, you know, um, many do not have um, a clear enforcement mechanism and strategy put in place. And so, for instance, um, Kenya's data protection bill uh, uh, makes Kenya the third country in East Africa to have legislation committed to data protection. The legislation then kind of seeks to manage and protect data once it's acquired, processed, and stored, and it gives effect to Article 31 C and D of the Constitution, which contains the right to privacy. 
um, the 2019 Act in particular then requires data controllers and processors to ensure you know, data quality, uh, minimize uh, collection of data, and also restrict further processing of data, and that they should engender and maintain security safeguards to protect personal data in effect. And with this said, you know, it actually still quite, uh, remains unclear uh, regulations all mandates of this kind actually manage biometrical databases in particular. And, and so Kenya has made claims uh, that the current data legislation is a satisfactory mechanism to regulate protection, um, yet, you know, exactly how this legislation will be enforced on, um, say, AI devices uh, remains uh, also unclear. Um, and as smart city initiatives are established, there's also no industry-wide regulations on uh, digital technologies like biometrical uh, databases and facial recognition technologies in Kenya, but also really across East Africa. Um, Kenya's uh, Data Protection Act supposedly empowers the data commissioner uh, to set regulations and establish you know, the threshold for mandatory uh, uh, registration by data processors. Yet it is also not clear what authority and tools you know, um, um, this commissioner has to mitigate privacy abuses. Likewise, there's also no means to audit the algorithms that empower facial recognition technology or sanctions that seek to halt the harvesting of uh, biometric data from the population without robust checks and balances. So the commissioner thus far has issued two uh, guide notes on the notion of consent and data protection impact assessment. Uh, the note and consent provides guidance on the processing of personal data while aiming to preserve consent, whereas the note on uh, data protection impact assessment offers guidance to data processors on when and how to make assessments. Um, and so, you know, to somewhat conclude on some of these kind of, uh, you know, uh, remarks, you know, it is, you know, a salient to accompany, you know, these um, increasing developments and use of uh, technology with appropriate measures um, to advance legal safeguards and to promote best practices along with the kind of collaboration of digital advocacy groups can move the needle uh, towards uh, somewhat preserving a more robust regulatory framework um, uh, that seems to be now challenged uh, by uh, digital surveillance and precisely you know such action you know can uh, i believe in some sense accelerate the learning curve on these issues and the devices uh, that are contextually relevant to policy solutions that ensure both the kind of the demand uh, for surveillance technologies in these regions with an interest and in the preservation um, of the civil liberties traditions in those um, regions and so i'll kind of stop there and hopefully have some questions. Can you hear us? Hi, uh, Megan Gates from Security Management Magazine. Um, I've been writing about smart cities and um, especially surveillance infrastructure. So I was interested in your talk, but I wanted to ask you um, if you could dive- Not to be a pain in the ass is not working. <laughs> Hello? Um, I wanted to ask if you could talk a bit about some of the um, human rights abuses that you've uh, seen this kind of technology used to enable in, in Kenya? And then if you could talk a bit about your research into actually understanding if sort of these smart cities and this vast surveillance infrastructure has any impact on public safety. I know you mentioned the 2014 and 2015 numbers, but if you had anything more recently. Sure. Um, I will kind of start on comments on smart cities and then I will kind of look into um, some of your comments about human rights abuses. So as it relates to smart cities, um, you should, you know, at least how I imagine them is that they're kind of these, um, you know, 
large assemblages uh, of technological devices that are procured uh, by both kind of African state actors, but you know actors across the global south, including uh, South Asia, you know uh, Central Asia, um, and even parts of South America. And the primary aim, at least, both the kind of the um, say at the kind of political economy level, is to kind of somewhat galvanize um, development. Um, and so states procure them with the supposition of being able to both address uh, structurally uh, long durates of concern around development, um, uh, but also in, in part to kind of consolidate um, technological means. Um, and, you know, um, smart city initiatives uh, have not really been able to demonstrate any of these kind of uh, two qualities. Uh, they've not really supported development, at least in any significantly obvious way. And so you can't really draw a correlation um, with kind of, you know, the procurement of say, um, smart, uh, smart city um, ICT infrastructure with improved um, outcomes in economic development. Um, and so it raises a kind of a basic question for us in terms of, uh, you know, then why are state actors, you know, procuring these technologies if it's not uh, obviously demonstrating any particular outcome. Um, at, at, at one level, um, it's probably connected with, you know, assumptions about uh, technologies, causative powers, which, which are not particularly corollary to any kind of real economic or political outcome. Or you know you can also then connect it with other kind of uh, national security um, interests. In the specific case of Kenya, uh, what you do see um, is that there was an increasing amount of kind of procurement of uh, CCTV technologies uh, from um, companies like Huawei, um, um, in part to kind of support two initiatives. At, at one level, it's about crime prevention and deterrence. And then at the, at the other level, um, it's about national security. Um, and you particularly see a series of deals being made after the kind of the bombing of uh, Westgate Mall. And so in that sense, uh, it's, it's mostly kind of connected um, with national security uh, prerogatives and deterrence, um, whether or not you know, they have somewhat supported those initiatives it's not particularly made clear to us in part because um, both um, Kenya, um, Kenyan officials, but also say Chinese companies have somewhat remained systematically silent in terms of um, the data they're able to kind of provide uh, scholars on this note. Um, and so thus far, at least to us, it's not actually clear that they have supported any initiatives, uh, but they are obviously financial gains for people to be participating in some of these deals. Um, and then as it kind of um, relates to human rights abuses, what you do see um, is that there is um, an uptick um, in incidences um, around uh, surveilling uh, kind of political opposition. Less so in Kenya, although there is an increase in surveilling of kind of Muslim Kenyans. So that um, has been somewhat established. Um, um, and that this technology um, is uh, supporting some of those kind of initiatives, and that kind of you know goes beyond the kind of the uh, the kind of the, the scope of of, um, of the regulatory framework around these technologies, and so they are being abused um, in kind of supporting that and state activity. But the other abuses are uh, kind of more obvious, uh, particularly related to kind of political opposition in countries like Uganda, um, where. Uh, it's also the same vendors who are supporting it, and it's being made financially reachable through um, loans that are connected with the BRI. Um, and so um, it's there, but it's not systematic. And so it would be difficult to kind of draw an immediate correlation uh, with it, but it is, um, it is a kind of a spillover consequence of it. I hope that somewhat helps or were you looking for something more? I think that's all the questions we have on our side. <laughs>
Okay, great. I, it looks like I have questions um, on the chat. Should I address those? Yeah, you, you, they, they, they can hear you. Just uh, re re read a question and respond. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so the first question is, um, do you see countries adopting such authoritarian slash totalitarian surveillance systems and methods uh, from China moving in or closer to China's orbit as a result of a shared, uh, shared practices? And is uh, the main reason countries are adopting Chinese surveillance technologies because of cost or aligned political systems? Um, and so I'll try and address the first one. Um, and so this is a kind of an, it's an interesting question in terms of, um, you know, the kind of the political commitments of the procurers of Chinese surveillance technology, um, China itself, and then the kind of, you know, the kind of political arrangements of these kind of given countries. And so if you look um, into effectively China's kind of diplomatic um, engagements across the global South, uh, mostly in Africa, there's really no immediate correlation between um, uh, where it distributes its technologies as relates to the kind of the political um, arrangements on the ground. Um, so, you know, China is not more active with uh, authoritarian countries in Africa, and or is it uh, less, you know, active with democratic countries. And so there's no kind of immediate correlation um, at least in terms of its kind of um, both diplomatic, but also its kind of uh, private activities. Um, and kind of Kenya and Ethiopia are kind of interesting uh, countries in part because um, there is um, a correlation as it relates to Chinese activity and access to mineral resources. And so um, China has generally been more active in African countries uh, that have mineral resources than others. Uh, but China's largest investments in ICT infrastructure um, on the continent is in Ethiopia and in Kenya, which have markedly different political arrangements. And so um, that kind of generally tells us uh, a bit about uh, China's kind of um, a almost, I would call it amoral, but almost a political uh, engagement as relates to, you know, the uh, kind of political makeup of a given country. Um, which in some sense is actually quite ideologically consistent with uh, the CCP's uh, messaging around state sovereignty. Um, but of course, this kind of kind of almost um, amoral, apolitical uh, uh, disposition in terms of uh, state engagement uh, obfuscates the, what I'd argue, the kind of the asymmetries of diplomatic relations, i.e. that like, uh, it's true that, you know, it's willing to, you know, work as equally with democracies on the continent and with um, authoritarian governments, but regardless of, of those distinctions, those relations are defined by a kind of economic asymmetry between Beijing and those African countries. And that when China insistently talks about state sovereignty, it's also in some ways um, not talking about the asymmetries that determine um, those relations um, and, and the economic activities um, that is kind of grounded by the you know, language around um, state sovereignty. Um, now, the other part of it, of this question is kind of interested in the kind of um, the, the kind of the growing uh, Chinese political orbit. Um, in some sense, um, that is a kind of a, a diplomatic strategy, at least from the side of Beijing to effectively increase um, both its kind of uh, political, economic and soft power um, across the globe, uh, especially in Central Asia, uh, but also now markedly um, on the African continent. And, and those motivations in some sense are connected with kind of older um, economic and diplomatic interests uh, that can really be marked as early as uh, 2011 um, and even earlier in like in 1995 with the kind of the go out policy. Um, uh, but it's kind of most markedly seen now with the kind of the emergence of, of, of the BRI, um, which, which is the kind of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really an umbrella term uh, for multiple uh, infrastructure investments that range from say uh, railway investments all the way to 
uh, digital surveillance uh, capacity uh, building um, to effectively fiber optic connection uh, projects. Um, and um, what is quite interesting about the BRI in particular um, is both its kind of interest in offering um, financial uh, rumination for Chinese corporate actors, whether it be kind of large SOEs to, uh, to middle-sized corporations, um, all the way to thinking about its kind of uh, diplomatic arm. Um, the kind of the early stages of the BRI seemed not to be interested in the kind of credit worthiness of, um, of a specific um, project. And so that's why it was somewhat financially costly at the beginning. But it now it looks like Beijing is uh, really trying to um, look for more uh, credit worthy uh, investments. Um, but uh, the credit worthiness part of it is really secondary to increasing uh, diplomatic relations uh, with countries um, that are somewhat seen to be at least politically neutral. Uh, and so in some sense, it is interested in kind of um, building um, stronger, friendlier relations uh, with non-Western aligned uh, countries. Um, and uh, the BRI in some senses is both, you know, literally closing infrastructural gaps in the global South, but it's also kind of closing um, metaphorical uh, political gaps. Um, I could elaborate further on that, um, but there's another question here. And this uh, question is, what is the best way for Western countries to respond to China's mass uh, surveillance offerings? Oh, so this is a, uh, an interesting question in part because I've been thinking a bit more about um, the really the legislative gaps um, in Kenya, which I think are somewhat um, representative of, of, an, of a number of um, uh, of a, a number of really of countries across um, the global south, and in some sense, it can even mark examples in Europe. Um, so the, there's a couple of things that would be done, but kind of to take a, a step back, instead of thinking about intervention, to me, it's it's somewhat important to also look into into local contexts and to think about the you know the what I call the kind of the push and pull factors um, of these technologies. They're not, you know, simply connected with uh, kind of um, Chinese diplomatic ambition in the global South, which that's just, you know, a part of the story. Um, the other part of it is that there is real um, infrastructural gaps uh, that, you know, um, global South countries have been aiming and, and wanting to close and that uh, China has been able to offer uh, effectively financially reachable means to do so. Um, and that is, you know, connected with uh, state policy uh, that is uh, keenly seen in the BRI. And it's also um, connected with, uh, you know, local ambitions uh, that are preoccupied with uh, uh, sustainable uh, development. Um, and so the keen interest um, in, in, say, ICT infrastructure investments is marked that marks that and surveillance technologies in particular are a singular expression of that general commitment to seek um, local uh, solutions via Chinese um, investment. Uh, and so in terms of uh, responding to some of the, these concerns, in some sense, it's really about communicating uh, some of the kind of the fallout and spillover consequences of these technologies in part because they're marketed as a, as a means of securing development, uh, as a means of addressing um, local um, concerns. Um, but what is quite obvious is that they're not immediately addressing any obvious domestic concerns. And so communicating that in some sense to me opens uh, both a conversation uh, about them while also simultaneously also offering a means to kind of challenge um, its um, China's kind of growing diplomatic influence in these regions. Um, and then another part of it, um, it's really about thinking, you know, groundedly, as I say, in terms of thinking about, you know, what are uh, local activists, uh, what are kind of local legislators thinking about as they're 
both integrating these technologies into their administrative and national security apparatuses. And then also how are they are thinking about closing um, some of these gaps. And in you know, countries say like um, South Africa or Kenya, uh, debates are already being had in terms of seeing the negative spillover consequences of these technologies and people are interested in trying to figure out um, local legislatively led initiatives um, that seem in some sense to be positive but don't seem to have much teeth and so kind of supporting uh, those efforts seems like another obvious space and then in countries that seem to you know um, not see an interest um, in addressing these concerns um, those countries then I feel need to be kind of engaged at a regional level. Here I'm specifically thinking of countries like Zimbabwe, uh, which seem in some sense to have a long durée of um, human rights abuse, uh, but also um, have shown no immediate interest in kind of curbing out the spillover consequences of these technologies. Um, and, and so to those countries, to me, you know, uh, the kind of a regional pact like the kind of Afro, um, the, the AU Convention on Cybersecurity is one way in which uh, we can, you know, negotiate and engage with those parties. Um, obviously, uh, and then lastly, you know, uh, my point on this would be is that there already are um, some um, regional tools in place and they can address this. And once again, they just simply don't have much bite. And so the kind of uh, the AU convention on kind of cybersecurity in some sense was put in place in 2014 to think about um, uh, data protection at a kind of uh, at a regional level. Unfortunately, um, you know, uh, for it to go into effect, you need about 15 signatures. Only five African countries have kind of signed onto it, um, and so the real question is: is why have uh, other countries not signed onto it? Um, and um, and that's kind of where we'd also have to start thinking. You know, but I could exhaust this point, um, but you know, um, I'll kind of leave it to you again. I would 